Hi there, my name is Laura Bell and wherever you're joining me from today, I hope you enjoy this talk. Today we're going to be talking about failing fast, not in the cool way, you know, we all want to fail fast and learn things, but some of the ways we can fail fast by overlooking our own bias when we're trying to speed up application security. Please join in, in this talk, consider it a self-assessment of sorts, a way to look at your own practices and see if you can improve, and then join me afterwards for the q and I'll be available to answer your questions. The desire to go faster is really natural. We're all quite lazy as people. Humans are a lazy species. We want to go fast, we want it to be easy, and application security is no different. We want to make sure that when we're securing our applications, we're not getting in the way of that progress, of that speed. But some of the ways that we behave and some of our innate biases do get in that way. They create weaknesses and vulnerabilities where there shouldn't be them. And we're going to talk about three of those today. Specifically, we're going to talk about seniority bias, tool bias, and recency bias, and how each of these can manifest inside your teams and your practices to create vulnerability and problems that could lead to security issues later on. And we're going to round out today by overcoming that bias and learning how to go even faster. This is a strange format for a conference. This is a strange year with the, with, that we're in today, but I really hope that you enjoy this and that you can bring your questions and your experience to me afterwards. Please reach out on Twitter, lady underscore nerd, or in the Q&A. Now, I'm going to start with a little bit of a caveat. I was the co-author on the book by uh, O'Reilly Media of Agile Application Security, but whether you do Agile DevOps, DevSecOps, or something in between, I really don't mind. This talk isn't about particular labels. Security isn't about particular labels or dogmas or styles. Security is security. We want to protect things, whatever terminology we're using for our way of working. So whatever label you use, just park that for now. It doesn't matter. Let's just assume we all want to go fast and we all want to get more secure as we go. Now the first bias we're going to talk about is seniority bias. That's the idea that those of us who are more senior, a little bit older, who've been doing it longer, are somehow better at securing our applications than everyone else. This is the type of bias that manifests with sentences like this occurring in your team. We can only go far faster if we hire experienced or senior engineers. This is the type of language you will see in high growth companies who think everyone needs to be 10x or ninjas. I hate those phrases, so showing my own bias there. Now, let's do a little bit of a self-assessment. The symptoms of seniority bias are as follows. So, does your team only advertise roles or recruit for senior level engineers? Is it difficult for people to come into the engineering space in your organization? So that's a lack of juniors or a lack of people transitioning between technical specializations. Are named individuals responsible for peer review of all pull requests or code changes? So we also call this in security key person risk, the idea that there's one person who's central to processes and if they take a day off, everything stops. Now, look at your world. Are you that key person? Are you that named individual, the only person who knows about a particular system or a particular style of application? And so everything goes through you. If that's you, we've got a problem with seniority bias. We also have assumptions around common sense. I've been guilty of this myself. You may have too. Saying that, well, it's common sense. If you're a senior engineer, we all know how to do security and to solve complex development challenges. But the reality is, we don't. We all come from different backgrounds, and those backgrounds give us different sets of skills and experience. For some of that will include security knowledge, but for some it definitely doesn't. Just because you've been doing it a long time, it doesn't mean you've learned the same things as everyone else on the way. So how do we start to overcome the impact of seniority bias? Well, we start by understanding what that impact is. What could go wrong, and how can it affect our security? The first impact is burnout of key people. If people can't take breaks or leave, or they're responsible for every single request in your system, they're going to burn out. And burnout is a big security issue. We don't make good decisions when we're burnt out. There's high impact if team members leave the organisation. So we don't want this. You know, if Sal or Taylor leave, we want to make sure that somebody else can pick up what they're doing really easily. That doesn't mean heavy documentation, but it does mean processes that share the knowledge equally across the team. 
we can also see a stagnation of approaches because those of us who've been around a little bit longer are used to doing things in one way or another it might be difficult for new voices or new approaches to be heard now some of us are really lucky you're here at a conference today and you're expanding your range of skills and approaches but not all seniors have that luxury and so we might find ourselves stuck in the same patterns of doing things we have been doing for a number of years. Equally, knowledge sharing across our teams and cross-skilling will be really, really poor. And that's because, well, everything is going to the same person and if they're busy, they're not going to have that time to share and nobody else is getting that experience naturally as part of their roles. That impact is really high. That seniority bias means we're not getting new security approaches. And then if one person breaks under the strain or takes leave, then we have a massive impact on the team. Don't let the security of your application be based on whether one person is okay in doing well in their job today. So tool bias is our next bias. Now we're gonna round up at the end as how we can overcome all of these biases, but we're gonna do them first, um, one after the other. So tool bias. Now, the symptoms, the quotes you might hear if you've got a tool bias are things like this. We can only go faster if we buy this tool or system. Now, we're at a conference. Many conferences will have a tool bias in them. You know, there's tools that are being talked about in these talks. You should do this. You should try that. Here, this big company did this thing and they used this tool so they were able to do this thing faster. We are bombarded in every aspect of our engineering life with marketing material that tells us tools will solve our problems. But as engineers, we also know that that's rarely actually the case. Tools are a great asset. They can help us go faster, but they also come with a real problem set of biases. So let's do our self-assessment again. I want you to play along. Let's do symptoms of tool bias. So you have a tools bias if you're spending thousands of dollars on tools and systems to integrate into your development lifecycle. Not every tool needs to cost you a lot of money. There's a great deal of amazing free or open source tools out there. And not everyone needs to be spending that much money. Or if they are spending it, there are maybe other things that they could be spending on instead of tools. Do you have tools purchased but not properly implemented into your build pipeline? So maybe they were put in and then they were removed because they were causing you pain. Or maybe you got them and you kind of you put them in a learning mode but you never got them fully installed. That's a tool bias. You've spent the time and focus because the tool will solve the problem, but we've not actually solved the problem. We've got halfway there and stopped. If there's no plan for maintaining, tuning or configuring tools past post purchase, also known as a salesperson driven development style, then you've got a tools bias. Your tool has not made you more secure. Your tool has given you the feeling of security, but without the actual action. Now, what's the impact of this? Tools purchased a long time before they're required in the pipeline cost time and money, and they are a distraction. If you are not ready to do a full CI CD pipeline, buying a vulnerability scanner or a software analysis tool that is going to sit in that pipeline is too early. You're going to have tens of thousands of dollars worth of software that you're not going to be using. That money could be used on other things like ensuring your quality of your CI CD pipeline or testing automation or upskilling everyone to make sure that the new style of working, this new uh, development pattern is well embedded. Tools might be chosen without analysis of impact on workflow. Now, I'm a security person, we're guilty of this. We will say, hey, development team, here's a tool, you should go use it. But often we haven't considered the workflow properly when we suggest those tools in. So those tool decisions need to be made between software team and security to get this right and you have to analyze that input as you go <coughs> tools and processes are offboarded out of development teams creating a fractured approach now we see this a lot in larger organizations who are lucky enough to have big fully resourced security teams where tools can't go into the pipeline because they're going to break it they're going to slow it down and what happens instead is they take the tool out and say okay well the security team will run this tool and bring the results back in this creates a really fractured approach where not only are the tool outputs coming back in at the wrong time in the flow but the impact of that workload isn't really being realized by the outsourced team i like to call this the gym membership effect and i've definitely been guilty of this myself 
This is an organisation believing it's solved its issue at purchase. Now, if you, like me, have ever bought a gym membership because you wanted to get healthy, you feel great, you've bought your gym membership, you're gonna go, it's great. But buying the gym membership doesn't get you healthy, going to the gym does. A tool, diet, tool buyers is the same deal. Buying the tool is not the improvement. Using the tool, refining your usage, and making it work for the whole area, that's where the impact is. Our final bias we're going to talk about today is recency bias. Now, we're at a conference, so there's a slight irony in this one, and in fact, people like myself who speak at conferences are guilty of propagating this, but we're going to talk about it and how it affects your security. The idea that we can only go faster and be more secure if we do the latest thing that we read about. So I went to this conference talk today and they said I should do a thing and so we should do that right now. And so we switch very rapidly between our approaches. We bring in new tools and frameworks. We switch to, oh well, the latest front-end framework is this and we should do that instead. And if we're always switching to the most recent thing that we've heard, it has a massive impact on what we're able to achieve with security. So let's self-assess again. Have you got a recency bias? So, lots of started but incomplete security initiatives. So you've got a security backlog but not a lot is getting completed on it. Initiatives are losing momentum after initial kickoff or failing to achieve measurable outcomes. That's because you're switching to new things all the time, the latest shiny project. If you've got that, then you want to be careful. Frequent focus shifting and difficulty understanding overall security approach often leads or contributes to recency bias. So if you got that kind of magpie approach, as we call it down here, chasing shiny things, then you've got a recency bias. And the security that's really, really dangerous. It will create a massive backlog of security initiatives that need to be finished, spend a lot of money, but won't actually achieve the application security outcomes that we need. So what are the impacts then of this recency bias? Time and money wasted on many started projects. We all feel good starting a project. It feels great, shiny and new and exciting. But if we don't finish it, then it's not worth the effort. We need to be actually getting on and completing these things. It gives a perception of working hard, but it doesn't achieve measurable aims. You know, depending on how performance review works in your organization, I've seen this before, we've all seen this before. If I start these new things, everyone looks at the start, they give me a gold star, and then I don't really have to finish it because everyone's forgotten. It doesn't work for security. If we don't finish it, we don't stay secure. It undervalues the complexity of some initiatives. If you find that actually you're putting everything on and starting everything very quickly with a, uh, a fast focus switching approach, you may miss the fact that some of these projects and some of these initiatives are really quite hard and they need time and focus for you to get through them. It often leads to teams being overstretched as they try and take on too many things. Um, small security teams, as found in most parts of the world, are already overstretched and so your even smaller application security team don't have a lot of resources, they don't have a lot of energy for new initiatives pick very carefully and don't switch constantly otherwise they're going to have a real headache from contact switching and lock, loss of focus. So how do we overcome this bias? We all have a bias. We have many bias. It's a description not a justification though. Just because we have the bias it doesn't mean that that's acceptable. I know that I have many bias in the way that I approach the world um, and I know that not all of those bias are healthy and not all of them make me more effective at my job. So your job is to spot which bias you have and how it's affecting the effectiveness of your application and security projects. So how do we challenge them? Well firstly we challenge them with discipline. Overcoming innate behaviours doesn't happen by itself. It takes self-awareness and discipline to do that. You need to look at yourself, answer our self-assessment questions and go yes I have a problem and I'm going to do something about it. It takes focus. Hiring broadly, taking it slowly with tools and doing less stuff might feel like the hard way around. Like nobody wants to stand back at their performance review and say, hey, I did less this year, but I did it really well. That feels like a really unnatural way to think, do things, but I want you to do that. I want you to buy less tools. I want you to hire more broadly and I want you to do less projects this year. Make that your aim for the year. Do less projects, but do them at a higher level make them phenomenal 
and I want you to do this with consistency. It's really easy to fall back on old, ha old habits when we're pushed for time or we're stressed, but it's when we need to focus and discipline, have discipline the most. When we are stressed, we will fall back on whatever behavior is easy for us to do. And that means the ones where we don't have to think, the muscle memory. And if your muscle memory is to favor a senior member of your team, or just say, hey, oh, it's all right, well, I'll just do it this time. Don't worry about it. I'll be quicker if I do it. That, that's that inconsistency. That's that discipline that's being overridden because of the stress. So every time, even when you're stressed and busy, I want you to think about this. That, this am I using the broad s skills in my team? Am I favoring seniors over juniors? Am I taking it too fast or too slow? Am I favoring a tool and thinking I've got be benefits where I don't? Am I doing too much at once? Do less, buy less tools, use all of the skills and experiences in your team whether they're senior or not. Fast-paced security isn't easy and there's no quick fix. There are many talks about how to put security into your pipeline, but there's very few people talking about how we get in our own way when it comes to securing our applications. So today, what I want you to take from this is actually, aside from the tools and aside from those approaches, there are little bits that each of us can look at with the way we behave that could be impacting our application security. And by keeping our bias in check and calling out the bias we see around us, we might be able to improve the situation. If you have any questions, please join me in the chat or please reach out to me either at hello at safestack.io or at lady underscore nerd on Twitter. Thank you so much for your time.